Studio Yukiko is based in Berlin. Founded in 2012 by Michel Phillips and Johannes Konrad, it meanwhile grew into a collective of collaborators. In less than 10 years' time, they conquered a leading position in editorial design. In their contribution, they will show us their projects and tell us how they work together. So hello Ultrafat, we wish we were with you in real life today, but we're really glad to be here, nonetheless zooming in from our respective home offices. So my name is Madeline Morley, I'm a design journalist and I'm here today with four team members from Studio Yukiko, who I'm going to be interviewing. So Yukiko is a design studio that I've personally been following for a number of years now. Instead of the formal introduction, I thought I'd speak briefly about my own encounters with the studio over the past few years. And I was thinking about it and I, I first came across Studio Yukiko's work back in 2015 when I was working in London for It's Nice That. And we profiled a book that they designed for the photographer Matt Lambert. And it was really raw and really punky. And I remember we were all really drawn to its use of materials. And so that's how I first started seeing that work. Shortly after, I began working for a blog about editorial design called Mag Culture. And I reviewed Flaneur magazine a number of times, which Yukiko has been involved with since its beginnings as founding team members and as the designers and art directors. So basically, or essentially each issue of Flaneur centers around one street in one new city, each issue, and it uncovers stories about the street throughout. And at the time, I found the magazine really, really refreshing. Most of the titles around were really clean, really minimal and beige. They were all kind of following along the, the kind of kinfolk aesthetic. And Genève was really bold and full of color and typographically adventurous and I remember being intrigued to see a kind of literary approach to design throughout and such rich and luscious kind of print techniques and a very conceptual and concept driven approach to the design. So since then, I've, I've followed Yukiko's print work with interest. They created more art books over the years and then they started Sofa magazine with the same publisher behind Fanat. And Sofa is a magazine about the digital world and kind of cyber chatting. And because of Yukiko's personal projects like these two particular magazines, the studio has really fostered a particular strength when it comes to unearthing stories about local communities, bringing those stories to a wider audience and also understanding the trends of internet culture and youth culture. So building on this, they also started art directing Sleek magazine for a number of years. They got involved with designing Year Zero, which is a youth culture platform and magazine in Istanbul. Recently, the team also took over the design direction of art title Cura and the list of their print work goes on and on and on. When I first moved to Berlin about five years ago, I began to encounter more of Yukiko's work outside of print, just kind of as an everyday Berliner coming across its branding and identities out on the street. And it always catches my eye because it's it's got this arresting feel and it has this signature Yukiko kind of style to it. There's been their Nike campaigns. Um, there's been festival branding for things like Reverence and Planar Festival. There's been exhibition identities like the recent Magical Soup at Hamburger Bahnhof and also all sorts of other identities that 
I've kind of come across digitally um, and online, not just out and about on the streets. So I'm really looking forward to speaking to four team members of Yukiko today because I know through conversations um, with, with everyone that their process is a really collaborative one. So Michelle Phillips and Johannes Conrad started collaborating together way back in 2012. Sebastian Milo has been working with them for about five years and Ira Ivanova for about three. So today we're really going to sort of explore the studio's process, its background, its sensibility, and it's super, super rare for me to have this opportunity to speak with four members together of the studio. So I hope we can use this chance to really probe and think about your attitude and team spirit um, as a studio together. Because one of the things I wanted to ask you about is how you, I know you work a lot with cultural institutions, but you also work with a lot of brands and in the kind of more commercial sphere. And I'm, I'm curious about how you straddle these two worlds um, and what you found is the common denominator between the two, how you kind of use your knowledge of both when designing for either side of those two, two coins. Yeah, I guess I, I could reply to that. Um, so basically, if you imagine the cultural and commercial worlds as uh, this neighborhood neighboring fields um, i would say that we work with the projects that are pretty close to this borderline from each side and I, I think that allows us to work with clients who are willing to go the same place we're going and uh, kind of towards exploring something new and fun and exciting it sounds like something that everyone wants <laughs> but it's quite a rare situation so i'm very thankful to, and I, I think I speak for all of us, <laughs> uh, that we're thankful to our clients who are brave enough to be doing such projects. And uh, yeah, I think as an example, maybe Michelle could tell a few words about uh, Magical Soup and an exhibition that Maddie already mentioned that we designed last year. Um, yeah, Magical Soup, I guess. Um... This was a really nice project for us because obviously it's a big museum in Berlin. Um, so it was really nice to be able to do something for a culture that was so, um, for an institution that's so important to Berlin. Um, the curators had a really nice show, um, sort of all about um, sound and media art and sort of how visual and sound can uh, create new kinds of worlds and new kinds of realities. And um, we took quite a conceptual approach, pulling on some of her references from like the Mock Turtle song, The Beautiful Green Soup from Alice in Wonderland, but also um, uh, uh, the philosopher Wittgenstein, who talks a lot about language and where it comes from and things like this. So we just took the title of the exhibition and kind of played with it in a number of different ways typographically to the point where sort of either it repeats itself to the point where you can't understand it anymore or it's so distorted or within the book we sort of like distorted it in many different kinds of ways so um this was i think it was something quite new for the hamburger bahnhof to have a very very graphic approach to uh, such a big exhibition but um i think it was well received <laughs> yeah i mean i have another example of um like from the commercial maybe from the one from commercial world um, maybe i can say something about playgo uh, so it it's a video identity uh, we ca just came up with this term finally <laughs> but uh, anyway it's a video identity for content series and uh, in the first months of the lockdown nike got together with uh, peggy Gu to create a quarantine playlist and uh, it, it was like a uh, workout series featuring Peggy's own tips for warming up and uh, self-care. Um, so for us, the task was to help the narrative to open up through this fun and uh, exciting graphics. And so Peggy was in Korea at the time, so we based these graphics on uh, Korean TV show graphics. Hello from Korea. This is a perfect time to make some music and be creative. 
there's another exercise that I would like to show you. And if you're Korean, you need to know. You must know. This is an exercise that you can do with your family too. So, let me show you. I think it's a great warm-up, especially in the morning. So that would be kind of an example of the project that is quite a commercial, but uh, where we were kind of allowed to do all these fun things, which is kind of something that uh, you wouldn't expect from this kind of brand. Um, yeah. And how do you think um, the kind of the process of working together and also working with external freelancers, which I know is something that you also do a lot, how how does that collaborative process inform some of your concepts and um, output? Yeah, I think, I mean, for us, um, uh, I think we just, when you look at the work that we produce, you kind of see maybe um, something that connects them as a, as a, a playful attitude and a very energetic attitude. And to us, it's actually really, more interesting the to have this 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 energy behind it rather than like one visual voice or recognizable voice and for us it's the it's um it's really important to have always more collaborations and more um voices coming together in the studio so for example we um one um one project that um, illustrates this is very well is the campaign that we did for uh, Nike um, called Lauf nicht Rennen for Berlin, where we invited, um, I think it was five or six illustrators, a typographer, Johannes um, um, Breyer von Dynamo, um, who is also from Berlin, all Berlin-based um, artists and creatives to come and work with us in the, in the studio together uh, for a number of uh, days. And we kind of did a remix of everyone's work in the end. So people were even working with each other's files and we're swapping files. And it was just kind of a real organic process happening in the studio. And this was like, it's kind of the same when we work as a studio together as well. We always work um, in a sort of collaborative manner as well, um, amongst each other as well. Uh, so I think, yeah, it's like I say, I think it's uh, important to have these different voices and to have this uh, collaborative energy um, of, you know, creators getting together. Um, I think um, another uh, project that illustrates this really well is also Flaneur. Um, Flaneur is a collaborative approach uh, as well in the sense that um, Flaneur we've been doing for, I think now seven years, it's in its ninth issue um that we're starting now um and it's a it's a project where we go to a different city per issue um where we showcase a, a one road in this uh in this um city and we work with um different artists uh, creators writers um who all muse on this road or, or on the street and um they amongst themselves uh, collaborate uh, amongst each other uh, to create work for this issue um, or uh, we just invite them to contribute work um, and in itself it becomes a, a, a collaboration i mean we also we started off the magazine thinking that it was going to be a normal formal magazine with uh, contributions where you have you know, one piece starting and then the next one finished, uh, you know, the next one starting after after one another. And um, then we realized with issue eight, no, sorry, issue seven, I think, uh, the Sao Paulo issue, we realized that we didn't really want to create a proper magazine anymore. We, we wanted to really make this, this issue, this printed issue, feel like you walk on the street yourself and you're experiencing this kind of chaotic mess of the street you know where things are interlinking with one another you get visual you know clues here and there and we realized we wanted to just kind of fragment everyone's work and create like a gesamtkunstwerk you would call it i think that's also a, a, an english term you can use it 
and like a whole work of art. Um, and so the issue itself, um, in the end, we, you know, by, by, by fragmenting everyone's work or not everyone's work where it made sense, obviously we fragmented the work. Um, uh, we realized that we could create something yeah, more wholesome and, um, create something more special and to feel every, you know, to give sort of a framework where these, uh, multiple voices can can sit in well together um yeah so so for that issue you you kind of go to the city and you meet how, how do you start engaging and creating those networks of collaborators and and maybe you can talk a little bit more about that issue and how that then manifested as these kind of fragments in the in the issue um i mean it's very it's very organic process i think because we're going to sort of someone else's neighborhood or community you have to be quite sensitive you can't sort of go with any ideas of how it's going to look or feel or what you're going to put in at the end so it takes a lot of kind of listening and um research so when we arrive because we always go and try i mean the editors are there for like three months or something um we try and spend at least two weeks there and it's very much about just talking to as many people as possible, you know, literally walking the street as much as possible and just seeing where our networks take us. And it's always sort of like a, um, uh, I guess like a snowballing effect, like you meet some people and they introduce to others and they're like, oh, you should really meet this person talk to this person. Um, Sao Paulo was really nice because a lot of the life was on the street, literally. So you would just sort of literally be bumping into characters on the street and hearing all these really interesting stories. And um, I mean, the beautiful thing is that you might hear one story from one person and then hear the story again, but slightly differently from like another person. Um, this street also had lots of different communities um, kind of living next to each other. So at one end, there was like the Samba school and then in the middle, there's sort of, sort of the Italian quarters. And then at the top of the street, it got quite fancy. It's called sort of like the Bella Vista area. Um, so it's really important to try and include all those different voices and give them all room and not give anyone's one too much importance. So I think that's also why we kind of fragment the stories a little bit. So it's not just like this story starts and ends here, this one here, this one here, this one here. It's very, we try and reflect that kind of interwovenness or connectedness or complexity of um, narratives, I guess. Um, I'd just like to mention also that we met Ira doing the Moscow issue. So. <laughs> Sometimes our collaborations are like, you know, really long lasting and become really meaningful. Um, yeah, that's really sweet. Um, I'm, obviously, these kind of networks um, bring a lot and really inform how you then approach design. So I'm curious about your collaboration also with clients. Um, what when, when you're kind of taking a approach to a brief, what kinds of conversations with your, are you having with your clients and how do you also bring them into the process? Yeah, so I think like for us, it's important to, to um, not to feel like um, we're a service agency where um, a client just kind of, you know, comes to us with a very concrete brief and they say just kind of do that. But for us, it's really about, um, uh, kind you know an eye to eye relationship with the client so it's like a real collaboration um we don't really i think the conversations that we have with the clients are hugely different from one another so of course sometimes the brief is very you know it's maybe maybe much clearer um for example when you work for a sportswear brand maybe the 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 um the brief but also the way then it's signed off and the whole process is it's much more rigid um, but yeah, I think in a way, yeah, the conversations are different that we have with the clients. And I think it's also, um, it's really nice if when we get sort of when, when the client allows us some time to just develop our own thoughts behind the project. Um, yeah. But maybe, uh, Ira, you could tell, talk a little bit about what we did, uh, with Camper, uh, recently, because that's a interesting, Collaboration. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 a new one where we've never shown it anywhere because uh, it's still kind of in the production. But I'm hoping that it's gonna be on soon 
uh, with all these <laughs> restrictions and uh, lockdowns, but uh, fingers crossed that it's uh, launching really, really soon. Um, yeah, so basically uh, the task was to design a cafe in Berlin, in Mitte, uh, called Kamaleon. And the interesting part, as Johannes already mentioned, that it's a um, project initiated by uh, Kemper, a famous shoe brand, uh, who has a really long history and a strong visual identity. So basically, we actually went to their lab to learn about their visual codes and vibes. And so we could continue this line um we visited their museum and learned about their graphic history which is very quirky and um, they had these crazy posters over the years uh like with some weird messages and with some kind of weird visual metaphors so basically in what we did in this identity we tried to continue this kind of chain of thought um and this quirkiness and so um basically what what we came up with was this quirky character that kind of lives on all the surfaces of the cafe but it was so like um just to add to that i think that um we also worked with um actually going back to collaboration we also uh, work with uh, sebastian lyman on um some of the copy for it for chameleon and um he came up with this idea that you know the chameleon or chameleon uh, it's it's always changing colors and changing uh, the way it's ex expressing happiness or expressing sadness and it's um really um quite a moody uh character <laughs> um and it has this duality uh, so at its core it's um yeah it doesn't really it's always in like some kind of crisis it's always in like existential crisis that's why also maybe it's always changing um the shape um because it doesn't really know maybe it's actually kind of um um in indecisive quite an indecisive character actually um and um we kind of played with the with this uh, existential crisis actually that the chameleon has in the in the copy being kind of quite um humorous and quite heady which is in a way actually very um this was pre-pandemic by the way this uh that we developed this um it's been a while in development um but it works quite well in this post 2020 um life that we're uh, living right now i think yeah and um, this project copy is a really big part of the identity uh, not only so we not only have the visual part but the verbal one so um one other thing you know we've we've now seen images on our green screens of a lot of your work and one of the things that often an, an adjective i've seen to describe you many of times and maybe i've even used as maximalists and I wonder whether you agree with this assessment and what you think of the word maximalist. Um, do you think of yourselves as a maximalist studio and and where do you think this aesthetic and kind of sensibility comes from? Um, I think it's right, guys. <laughs> I think we're a little bit maximalist, yeah. um, minimally maximalist. <laughs> I think I think Ira meant touched on this a little bit earlier, but I feel like as we work in kind of graphic design, we, we sort of feel okay with reflecting the cultural impulses of here and now. Um, I don't think we try and do anything that's completely timeless. I feel like somehow in our field is um, that might be a bit futile. Um, I feel as designers, we're sort of always growing and learning as well. So that's why we're okay with our style developing and changing. And I, th I think it's also the same with our clients and organizations. Um, and I think sort of for us, maximalism translates into maybe just finding like the core message of a brand or an organization that we work with and just trying to be as direct and straightforward with that messaging. Um, and that means like sometimes it might mean, okay, just making it literally quite big. Um, but also I think maximalism can be quite expressive. Um, so it's not always about shouting everything, but 
just sort of being very generous with feeling, you know. Um, and for us, I mean, it's easier it's easier to sort of apply maximalism to sort of the commercial or brand work, for example. Um, but we also kind of try and apply this, but a little bit differently in our cultural work. So where sort of in the cultural fields, we're faced with a lot more complex ideas. And I think we really like to bring this complexity and sort of layeredness um, into our identities. So kind of like with Flaneur, you know, I was saying, we embrace like a plurality of voices and that sort of ends up in the in a sort of visual cacophony, which is okay because that that's how it is on the street. Um, maybe another example is like uh, with our Shed Heller identity. So Shed Heller is quite a radical arts institution in Zurich and um, they're really trying to question the role of the institution in today's climate where the conversations are very much around sort of politics and activism or ecological sustainability and social marginalization. And they want to create a living institution or question what's the role of the institution within these conversations. So um, they're very complex themes and the way they want to do this is to sort of team up with a diverse group as possible of um, artists and creatives, but also with other sort of research institutions um, in the field of sort of environmental sciences or social sciences. Um, so the way we dealt with this is to kind of take the idea of annotation and research and like draw on all these different um, visual cues and kind of bring them all in together sort of all at once as if it's like an identity that's thinking or learning or, you know, um, uh, you know, working with a lot of material. Um, and our logo in the end was kind of like a string of particles or cells that kind of keeps moving around on every application is different or in a different place or has a different form. So that was kind of to reflect the living, literally kind of the, the living institution kind of thing. Um, yeah, another thing about maximizing, I think the way we work together in the studio as well also encompass this idea of maximizing because for example, when you always, most of like bigger project or the one where we know we're going to have probably a lot of fun or express a lot, um, we're all going to start uh, on the project from the beginning all together. We either like talking about it at the beginning and even like graphically, like we're all going to sketch something together, which is, I think this is the most fun part of it because then it's where we try to push everything to experiment also and just try something new also from our perspective as graphic designers to try to push it. And then once we all look at it together, then we kind of pull out things out from each of us. Like for example, Nike Marathon, uh, we did for Berlin for 2020 was maybe one of like a good example of it where we all worked on it. We just look at it at the beginning on the first stage and we just say, okay, we take, I mean, we like this from Ira, from Michelle, from me and from Johannes, who was just like, okay, let's do some patches. Also let add some, some third layer or second layer to the, to the, to the work that we did um, beforehand with, um, as uh, sketches and this is also I think what's super interesting for us because then we happen to have something that we were not expected because we mix all of us together and then it's also push us just also as a studio just something something different also so some completely uh, unexpected and I think it was quite successful uh, with the campaign uh, because we had a lot of fun doing it at the beginning and just mixing everything together and it's I mean, this is what happens also at Yukiko and we, it happens a lot. And the same, I mean, also, I mean, either that if you are an intern or just like a junior graphic designer or senior art director, we all have kind of the same position also, the way we work or the way we accept or like look at each other um, uh, sketches or experiment that we, it doesn't really matter. I mean, we just, it just like we present us. I mean, we're not going to make any hierarchy between each work and then we just bring it up to a different level after and just talk about it together. And yeah. So obviously um, a lot of what we've been talking about is kind of having conversations together, um, working together, sketching together, meeting new people, collaborating together. And this year has been so challenging and there's been a lot of Kind of what we're doing now these kind of conversations over zoom um and I'm, I'm curious as a studio how have you adapted or kind of had to move some of your 
collaborative energy and spirit to this online space and what have you been doing to keep some of that alive during the last year um so i think what it was difficult for us at the beginning i mean what seb was saying about us being very collaborative is true like in the studio we're always looking over each other's shoulders or each other's screens or kind of like bumping each other out of the way and just taking over each other's keyboard and mouse and you know we don't we're not shy of sort of going ahead and kind of making suggestions on someone else's design or scribbling over them and things like this and um i mean the interesting thing about suddenly all being in our own spaces and having to work digitally was that we found a kind of a new process of working so now maybe like three of us might start a project together and we'll all work individually on lots of sketches and then we'll sort of we've created like a, a google deck workbook for each project and we'll keep throwing all our sketches in there like everyone will do it and these google decks will end up like 500 pages long or something and i mean we, and then every couple of days we'll come and together and have a look through them and we won't even know necessarily who's done what like it's just it's all like Seb says like it's all there sort of without any hierarchy but um we might say like we I mean you can kind of tell who's done what <laughs> a lot of the time because we have quite different styles I think but um it would just be like oh who's the who's done this or what's what was your thinking behind this like can you explain but we'll kind of choose all together the the directions that are jumping out to us and um sort of make an edit together and then decide as a team like which ones we want to sort of push forward um, so that's yeah that's been the interesting thing about sort of changing your working methods in COVID time but I, th I think I feel like we'll continue doing that as well when when we're back in the studio nice we're we're just about at time thanks so much um, for all coming together and thank you again to ultra fat um, for organizing and inviting and yeah see you all soon Thank you, Maddie. Thank you so much, Maddie. <laughs> it was very interesting to listen to everyone. <laughs> yeah, I know. I feel like I know you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. 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 Analyze my demise, I say I'm super anxious. Recognize I deprive this feeling, then embrace it. Vandalizing these walls only.